All right. So I think it's quite important to do what we did last week, which was to realize that Christianity arrived in Armenia during the lifetime of people who actually lived and worked with Jesus. That Christianity arrived in Armenia, as they say, doc doc, still warm from the physical presence of Jesus himself. It also arrived without written scriptures other than what we now call the Old Testament and the anecdotal remembrances of living witnesses. All of that, what we think of now as the canon of the New Testament, was still forming up. Christianity arrived in Armenia while the Apostle Paul was using the Roman Empire's own infrastructure to carry Jesus' teachings into the communities of Asia Minor and into Europe. And as we mentioned, he adapted those very Jewish teachings of Jesus to Gentile audiences for whom those teachings were not always so obvious in their meaning. So it may be that because Christianity arrived in Armenia, it seems, first of all, among Jews, the Jewish population of Armenia, one suspects that such a degree of adaptation as happened in Paul's churches might not have been necessary. And so in Armenia, Christianity sticks closer to its Semitic origins than was the case in the Roman heartland. In any event, when the occupied Jewish state in which Jesus had lived and worked disappeared gradually over the years 70 to 135 in wars with the Roman political superpower, Christianity, the religion of Christ, had established already an independent life in many locations outside the boundaries of that country and culture. And so it would be that for the next couple of hundred years, Christian communities in various locations we're in the process of forming up. What does it mean to be a community? What do we think? Developing that thought, developing community structures, beginning to pull together collections of sacred writings, considering the implications of what those writings might mean, figuring out what their place individually and as a community might be in the larger society where they found themselves, figuring out their relationship to Judaism and to other belief systems in their neighborhood, working out their own moral code, how and to what degree did Christians differ from the peoples around them. So there was a lot going on in the communities in the minds and hearts of individuals and in the development of identity for these communities as a whole. So what was happening in Armenia in this regard, in Armenia and in its influential neighbors during the more or less the roughly 150 years between the death of St. Bartholomew in 66 or so and the birth of Gregory Bartev the man we know as Armenia's illuminator in the 230s. After all, 150 years is seven generations worth of time. And a lot can happen in seven generations. You could just think of all that's gone on since 1870, just in this country. You can see there's room for a lot of events, people, happenings. So what in that intervening period of a century and a half made it possible for the phenomenon of Gregory to happen? What were the seemingly perhaps unrelated forces and events, the actions, the obstacles, the actors that somehow came together, apparently by chance, but nonetheless one might argue through the inscrutable divine will, to facilitate what we now look on as having been his life's mission. 
It's an interesting question because after all, Gregory, like everybody else who's ever lived on the planet, had to live his life forward, unable to see more than a step or two ahead of where he was, if that much, at any given time. So for him, none of what we look on as his life's mission was self-evident. And it's our privilege, in a way, to have the benefit of hindsight so that in his case, this evening, we can take advantage of our opportunity to look backwards with a more panoramic view, certainly than he ever had, and see what we might be able to discern about how the unfolding of apparently random and distant and unconnected events led as it seems from our vantage point, inevitably to the formal Christianization of Armenia. Well, it wasn't always that people thought about this question of the 150 years between the apostles and Gregory. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, for obvious reasons, people didn't give the question of that 150 year gap a great deal of thought. And so textbooks on Armenian history, even on Armenian church history, for use in the Middle East and even in the US, passed over all of that period in silence. And if one isn't watching the dates, it would be very easy to simply think, oh yeah, Apostle St. Gregory. <laughs> and this is understandable. People in that time period were focused on what was Armenian about the conversion of, of Armenia to Christianity under Gregory, who they knew was a Parthian, not an Armenian, but still for them, the, the, they were trying to shape in their own minds an Armenian identity after a cataclysm. So the fine points were not so concerning. But fortunately, People in the Middle Ages who were not recovering from the brink of almost absolute extinction, extinction did give this thought. And so when in the first half of the 19th century, people took an interest in this question, certain documents were rediscovered or discovered that contained information on that period, that 150 years between. And in the light of these documents, a reevaluation began of the information that was already known from early historians, especially from the seventh century historian Movses Gavan Gadvatsi, who wrote about Caucasian Albania, Stepanos Daronatsi, also known as Asorik, who wrote a history in the 11th century and Stepanos Orbelian, who was the bishop of the province of Sunik in the, from the, lived from the mid 13th to the early 14th century. So putting those historians and their information together with these new documents, the result has been a still tentative, but much fuller picture of what and where Christianity was before Gregory. Now, starting from around 1831, there are old Jamakirks, which have at the back of them useful information, such as lists of Armenia's first bishops, compiled in the days when people first became enthusiastic over researching pre-Gregory Christianity and before uh, the genocide events kind of took everything away. And these lists usually have between 25 and 29 names, depending. Although there is one by a learned Mukhitarist father named Mikhail Salantian, who gives only 16. He was more cautious about the kind of things he accepted into his list. His history of the Armenian Orthodox Church was written in 1862. And at the front of it, it has this massive chart of important people uh, in the history of the church. So I wanted to bring you a representative list 
<clears throat> this one happens to be from a Jama Kif that was printed in 1874 in Istanbul. And the compiler wanted to bring together everything that he could to show the breadth of early Christianity spread in Armenian population centers. So you can kind of see what he did. If you count all of his uh, listings, not just the 24, but the three at the end that he was not sure about, he didn't want to leave them out, but he didn't want to try and put them into the list completely. You have 27 people but then as you start to look at his list, you see, all right, well, he includes as number one, the Apostle Thaddeus, as number six, the Apostle Bartholomew, as number nine, the second Apostle Thaddeus. So we can kind of take them out. Um, we're not gonna consider them as, as first bishops. We're thinking about what happens after the apostles. So that takes you down to about 21. And then as we look at the list, we see Edessa, Sunik, Edessa, Caesarea, Sunik, Edessa, Ardas, Ardas, Sunik, Edessa, Sunik, Caesarea, Caesarea, Edessa. You're getting a pattern, yeah? There are four different areas, four different seas, if you like, to kind of use that term loosely, um, that he has combined together. And when we look at the, take them apart, we see that he has seven bishops' names from Edessa, another seven from Caesarea, three from Ardaz, and four from Sunni. So, if you're saying to yourself, Edessa and Caesarea are not in Armenia, you are correct. So, what he's doing is including those as centers of Armenian population. And Edessa and Caesarea both correspond with the missionary journeys of the Thaddeuses, as we looked at them last week or at the beginning. And we will come back probably <laughs> to these two centers, Caesarea and Edessa, and their continuing links with Armenian Christianity. But for the moment, for this evening, I want to concentrate on the two Eastern Armenian provinces that he includes in this list, Ardaz and Sunik. Sunik, you have probably heard of. Ardaz, maybe not. The Sea of Ardaz was located in the area of modern day Maku in Iran. It was once the territory of the Amaduni noble house, it fell within the larger province of Vasburagan, and it is home to this, the monastery tomb of St. Thaddeus that we looked at last week. It's located on one of the main roads in the area. It leads from the Armenian ancient capital, Ardashat, to Ekbatana. It had a checkered history. It started out with the Amadunis, then it became Ardzruni territory in the eighth century when the Amadunis left. Later it passed to the Bagratids in the end of the ninth century. Then it came back into the kingdom of Vasburagan. So now it's in Iran. Interestingly, according to a text that's called the Martyrdom of Thaddeus, the Gaia Panotun, Sirkuin Tadiosi. While the apostle was working in Armenia, he had with him a colleague named Zakaria, who is described as his yoke fellow and his fellow servant of the Lord. And Zakaria's job was to instruct the newly converted in the holy words of the gospel as the Holy Spirit inspired him according to the martyrology. And it's into Zacharias' care that Thaddeus, before his own martyrdom, commends the Armenian Christians. So Zacharia is his designated successor. We don't know for how, how long that would be because as he handed over the care of the community to Zacharia, 
uh, Thaddeus also predicted that Zakaria's martyrdom would not be long in coming. So we don't know whether, like it was in the case of Paul and Barnabas, Thaddeus and Zakaria had come out from Jerusalem as a team. But it seems possible because somehow it sounds a little unlikely that Thaddeus would have handed over the care of this community, the care and feeding, so to speak, of this community to a newly converted person rather than to an established tried and true Christian and colleague. Also according to the martyrdom, Thaddeus ordained a bishop named Eustathius in Sunique. So if we go back to the list, Eustathius of Sunique is the third person in the list. And Zakaria of Ardaz is the tenth. So they're both reflected in the Jamakirk list. And we'll come back to Eustathius and Sunik and all of that in a minute. So we have the details that are given to us in the martyrology, in the martyrdom of Thaddeus. To these details, we can also add those of another interesting document called the Kavazana Kirk Arda Zuashkari, the list of bishops of the land of Ardaz which was printed in Ararat, the periodical, in 1868 from a manuscript that had been discovered. So if we look at that, we see that instead of the three bishops of Ardaz that the Jamakirk listed, this gives seven from Zakaria, to Revondios, so we know that it reaches approximately to the year 180, more or less, because the information that comes with this list of names says that Revondios was martyred in the days of the Emperor Aurelian, who died in the year 180. So, thanks to this list, we can now stretch out the number of bishops that we have to cover pretty much um, up until 50 years before the birth of Gregory. It's interesting. The second name on that list, Zemendos. <laughs> we do know some other things about him. Zemendos had an earlier career before he became bishop as the superintendent of Rhodes in Ardas. So he was the DOT. His brother was also a civil servant in a way. His brother was the executioner who beheaded Thaddeus. And there's this kind of wonderful little tradition that says at the execution, Zemendos's brother, when he went to cut off Thaddeus's head, the sword slipped and he killed himself accidentally. And Thaddeus healed him. And so the execution is understandably postponed for a little while. And during that time period, we're told 500 plus people converted to Christianity and were baptized. Another 1,000 plus converted after Thaddeus's death. And it was seeing these miraculous events, the healing of his own brother and the wave of incoming new Christians that convinced Zemendos to become a Christian himself. So <clears throat> we have 120 years worth of bishops for the diocese, effectively, of Ardaz. And we'll be returning to Ardaz a little bit later this evening. But I want to move to Sunik. On the map, you can see that Sunik is one of the kind of medium blue provinces. It has its little arms, it looks like, or its mouth, depending on whether you think of it as, as a person or a crocodile, around Lake Sevan. So it's pretty extensive 
province. And it's ex it was extremely proud of its pre-Gregory Christian history. Now, the details that we have concerning Sunik's early bishops, other than what is in the 1831 Jamakir, come from a completely different kind of document. It's not a Kavazanakir, it's not a list of bishops, but it comes from the history of the province's uh, 13th century princely bishop, Stephanos Orbelian, that I mentioned earlier. He devotes chapter six of his history to a quite vivid description of the bishops. And if you have a chance to read it, it's very interesting. He talks about um, wonder working tombs and other miracles and things that attended the lives of these bishops. Stepanos does not mention, oops, here's where his seat is. If this looks familiar to you, it should for some of you. This is Noravank. Here's his tomb with one of his famous quotations. Some of us might relate. Being myself darkness, I desired to become a light for others. And he did, actually. Here are his bishops. He mentions Kumsi. Then someone that we're not sure whether he's a full bishop or not. It's a little unclear. His name is Lusig, so a little light. He became the overseer of Vanand, which was an area that later would have a number of monasteries in it. Babelas and someone named Mushe. It's interesting that he does not mention either Eustathius or Muchitar, who were included in the list in that 1831 Jamakir. So you wonder, okay, where did that information come from? If Stephanos doesn't have it, where did the compiler of that list find it? Stephanos also mentions something very interesting. He mentions that there was a famous monastery called Tanahat, which may be this, it's possible. It's one of the sites that's uh, pointed to as a possible location for that monastery. Founded in Sunik around the year 150 by a hermit named Mukhitar, whose tomb became a wonder-working pilgrimage site attached to the monastery. So that's interesting. Not only do we have communities of like lay Christians with a bishop, but apparently there's also in the time before Gregory, some type of monastic community Christian living in this area. So Christian communities large enough to need the oversight of a bishop in both Ardaz and Sunik, as well as at least some monastic slash communal living. So what else? Who else do we know about? Where else do we have groups of Christians? We're going to add to these two a community in the farther north, in the mountains, in the area between what's now Armenia and Georgia. The story goes that a Greek named Chrysos with four of his friends encountered Thaddeus in the north and were converted. Now what a Greek named Chrysos is doing in northern Armenia in the first place is a little unclear, but since the story goes on to say that Chrysos and his friends move in pretty elevated circles in the government, maybe they were there on official business. Anyway, they were either stranded or they chose to remain in that northern area after their conversion. And during that time, they began to preach, to share Christianity with those around them. And their preaching converted members of the Caucasian Albanian royal family, much to the disgust of the rest of that royal family. And Queen Satanik 
failing to convince Chrysos or the people he converted to return to their former beliefs, she had the preaching companions executed. Now, Chrysos is the only one of this little group that has a name. And the Armenian tradition remembers him by the name's Armenian equivalent, Voski. And so his companions are referred to as the Voskiank, and they're celebrated in the church's calendar. We also have a newly ordained Father Voski in their memory. Among the converts that Chrysos and his group made was a man named Sukiyas, who had 16 friends. And his story was a little bit different. He and his friends are also executed, but only after having lived a communal life, retired from the world in somewhere secret in the Chirapash Mountains, which are around here in Bagravan, near what used to be Varashagir, now it's Alashgir, it's in Turkey. Having lived that life for 40 years or more, so by the time these men are martyred, they're quite advanced in years. And it may be that they were killed in the same persecution that we are told took the life of Bishop Adar Nerse of Adaz in the early 90s when Domitian was emperor of Rome. And just as an aside about the Sukiyas Yank, they may be a phenomenon like the, um, the Thaddeuses. There were two Thaddeuses. It may also be that there were two groups of Sukiyas Yank, of Sukiyas friends, because the stories about them are very, very different. One story says that there were 19 of them and 17 of them were martyred. Another story says there were 364 of them. That's a big difference. One story says they were martyred 44 years after their conversion. Another story says that they were murdered, martyred after Khosrov II was killed. So that's the late third century. There's a long time in between, say, around 100, 105, and 300. So these two stories are, are very different. What they do do for us, although I don't know of anyone who's been able to tease these stories apart, what they do do for us is to say that not only individual converts, but also groups of people living together in what they cultivated as a specifically Christian life was characteristic of early Armenian Christianity. And so we find these groups of people being martyred together. So, if we put it together, even though all the details of their existence may not be clear, there were at least three concentrations of Armenian Christian population in Armenian populated areas, not necessarily within Armenia proper, before Gregory. So as you can see, the large orange circles, you have one on Edessa, one on Caesarea. The others are mostly clustered in the eastern end, in Ardaz, Sunik, and the area where Chrysos and, uh, hung out. We're going to come back to the little green circles, and eventually St. Gregory will plant the blue circles. There were enough Christians, in other words, for Khosrov the I to persecute them vigorously during the time after 180, when we have no more names of bishops. Perhaps we missed that information because people were completely going underground. But to help and fill in that blank space, we do have another piece of interesting information from the church historian Eusebius. 
Eusebius of Caesarea, so he has no real interest or stake in things that are happening in Armenia, although he's aware of them. He makes a passing mention in his history of people who were writing back and forth to Bishop Dionysus of Alexandria, who you see here depicted, who was a famous authority in his time. And Eusebius says, you can see it on the lower right, he, meaning Dionysus, wrote concerning penance or repentance to those who were in Armenia, whose bishop at the time was Mehrujan. Mehrujan, it's a good Persian name. This is in the 240s to 260s somewhere. So we have the name of a lone bishop from that time period. A Christian community, in other words, under his leadership, is in communion with other communities concerning a common issue in the life of the early church, which is what to do with people who deny their faith in a persecution out of fear under pressure and then repent and want to be received back into the church. So, if we look at those dates, it tells us that Dionysus's contemporary Bishop Mehrujan probably saw the persecution against Christians by the Emperor Decius a persecution that lasted 18 months. It might have lasted longer, but he didn't last longer. <laughs> uh, it lasted just as long as his reign. And he may also have witnessed or experienced the more intense persecution under the Emperor Valerian, who's shown on the left. In the year 257, Valerian issued two edicts requiring Christian clergy to perform the sacrifices to the gods that were required by the Roman state. On the one hand, and on the other hand, forbidding meetings in cemeteries. Christians were known for gathering in quiet places like that or in the catacombs in Rome. Then in 258, Valerian added another letter, ordering outright the execution of bishops and other high-ranking clergy, and also confiscating noble titles and properties from upper-class Romans who converted to Christianity even if they did offer the sacrifices. And if they refused to give up their title or their property, they were to be executed. It wasn't only about men. He also said that women found to be Christians were to be banished from the state. If a civil servant or a member of the imperial household was discovered to be a Christian, that person would be reduced to slavery and sent to hard labor on the imperial estates. Obviously, these are very harsh measures. And Valerian's son, Gallianus, shown on the right, revoked his father's harsh edicts. It seems that anti-Christian persecutions then were not terribly long lived. I mean, you could do a lot of damage in 18 months. You could do a lot of damage in, in three or four years. But it seems that they were not consistent in any way. And that the emperors who personally ordered such campaigns were few to this point. It's also interesting to see that in addition to the fact that Armenia had Christian communities 
large enough to choose bishops for, Christian preaching in Armenia by people coming in from the outside did not stop with the apostles either. Christians from other regions also came to preach in Armenia, including a famous Syrian Christian called Bardiasin, who was exiled to Armenia in around 216. And this was all fine. He was later considered a heretic, but prior to that setback, he was quite influential. And even though looking at back at his time period with hindsight, Moses Khorenatsi says, oh yeah, yeah, Bardiasin preached in Armenia, but he found no audience there. <laughs> a little bit of wishful thinking. He did. Remember that Christianity has not yet firmed up what are its essential doctrines. And so people were thinking about all of these things. and It was still kind of fermenting in people's minds. So he preached what did not later become mainstream Christianity, but some of it is quite recognizable. He believed in God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. That sounds familiar. Whose will is absolute, to whom all things are subject. He preached that God endowed man with free will in order to work out his salvation. He made the world to be a mixture of good and evil, light and dark. And he said that all things, even those that we now consider to be in, inanimate, have some measure of freedom of will, some measure of liberty. In all of them, the light has to overcome the darkness through that will to whatever degree it's present. He said that the world would come to an end after 6,000 years. That idea was not unique to him either. And that a world without any evil in it would take the place of this one. So far, we look at that and we go, okay, things we've heard. But he, to him, the sun, the moon, and the planets were living beings. To whom, under God, of course, the government of this world was largely entrusted. And although human beings are free, they are nonetheless strongly influenced for good or evil by the constellations. So his catechism, what he was teaching, was a kind of a mixture of Christian doctrines and what later were kind of eschewed, having to do with the zodiac signs and so on. He also made use of the, the fact that the word spirit in Syriac is feminine. And so his trinity includes a feminine aspect. He apparently denied the resurrection of the body, but he thought that Christ's body did have immortality and corruptibility as a special gift. So when he had to flee from Syria and come somewhere safe. It's really not that surprising that he came to Armenia because he was a Parthian, like St. Gregory after him, like the Arsacid dynasty, the Arshagunis in Armenia. So this is interesting. Lo and behold, there are not just communities of Christians, secular and uh, what we would now call religious communities, but there was a certain uncertain number of also, maybe not quite as kosher from our point of view, preachers amongst them. And in fact, there is a strong current of Syriac influence on Armenian Christianity, not just in the early period, but very much in the early period. Not surprising since the Southern part of Armenia not only bordered on the prosperous and very important, mostly Persian controlled province of Syria, but it had a mixed population of Syrians and Armenians. And the whole Southern tier of Armenian territory was bilingual Syriac and Armenian. And Syrian clergy appear to have served Armenian populations and probably vice versa as well. So there's a full exchange between these communities. So in short, at the time that Gregory Bartev finally came out as a Christian in the 280s, around the time that he was 50, he did so not as an isolated phenomenon, 
but as a member of an already existing network of Christian communities in Armenia. Now, most of the communities, as we saw on the map, the ones that we know about, appear to have been on Armenia's fringes, but they were not isolated. They had contacts with Christians in Syria and in Jerusalem, as we will see uh, maybe in two weeks, three weeks. And they had connections in Egypt, where Bishop Dionysus served. Armenian Christianity also had strong Jewish roots over and above its linguistic and cultural connections to the Semitic world, Syria and Jerusalem. So that's quite a bit of Christianity. And the question arises inevitably, if Christianity in Armenia did not begin with Gregory, if it already had an organization, if it already had dioceses, if it already had uh, monastic tech communities, what exactly was his role? in the development of Armenian religious identity? Well, actually that's um, something you'll be discussing more next week when Andrew is with us. So maybe the best question for us to look at with the rest of our time this evening is not so much what did he do, but who was he? And how did he, um, how did he get his start in these things? Well, as we would do with anybody, as we do even when we think about our own lives, to appreciate the phenomenon that Gregory was, we have to put him in a context. And that context reaches back into third century Armenian and non-Armenian politics. And it involves the very painful and fraught situation that came about in Gregory's clan of origin, in the family from which he descended. Now we have mentioned before that the kings of Armenia were clients of the Roman Empire, at least from the time of the Treaty of Rondea in 63, the days of Nero. And we talked about uh, Terdat the first going to Rome to pick up his crown again from Nero and so on and so forth. And thanks to that treaty, the situation in Armenia was such that while the king was a client of Rome, he was also chosen from among the ruling dynasty of Persia, the Arshaguni. So the same dynasty that ruled Persia rules in Armenia. And the Armenian Arsacids, the Armenian Arshagunis, were quite loyal to the Romans. And there exactly lay the problem. Let me show you the problem. The third century, the century in which Gregory is born. This is what the government of the Roman Empire looked like during this century. I've given you pictures of all of the emperors who ruled in this century. 35 emperors in slightly under 100 years. Do the math. <laughs> Rome was a debacle. An almost full century of chaos. Unbelievable, unbelievable stories in this century. So much so that it was officially called the crisis of the third century. And it included a particularly infamous year, 238, which went down in history as the year of the five emperors. You can imagine the instability that that would create. So as you can see, this is not a time when Rome is at the peak of its game. And not only so, but of these 35, rulers who are depicted here, 24 were murdered. Of the 24 who were murdered, 20 of them had reigned two months or less. This is terrible, of course, for Romans. It's also not good at all 
for any Roman client, such as Armenia, who might need to cash in on their treaty with Rome because of a neighbor's aggression. Terrible for Romans, ominous for Armenians, a bonanza for Persians. Specifically, a bonanza for this man, <clears throat> Prince Ardashir Sasanyan, whose name ironically means the one who reigns with honesty and justice. <laughs> it was a complete misnomer in light of his career, at least from the point of view of Armenians. So Ardashir, we won't go into his early career, although if you want to read about it, it's absolutely fascinating and somewhat unbelievable. After observing for a full 20 years the chaos that was pertaining in Rome and kind of foretelling that there would be no soon end to it, Ardashir chose to catapult his own clan, the Sasanians, to power during the reign of this lad, Marcus Aurelius Severus Alexander, became emperor of Rome at the tender age of 14 with his Syrian mother, Julia Mamea, as his regent and then his co ruler. And this young man had an unbelievable life. The circumstances under which he mounted the throne of the world's second superpower were absolutely hair-raising and traumatic. His grandmother, who was also a Julia, was a formidably powerful woman. Another one of her grandsons, Alex's Alexander's <laughs> older cousin named Elagabalus was already in power and grandmother watching him thought, oh no, he is going to be a terrible, terrible emperor. We cannot let this go on. And so she didn't do anything about that. She persuaded her grandson Elagabalus to adopt his cousin Alexander as his child, thus making Alexander the unquestioned next in line for the throne if something were to happen to Elagabalus. No surprise, something did happen to Elagabalus once this adoption had taken place. Grandmother Julia arranged for Elagabalus to be murdered together with his mother. And she didn't even allow them a burial. She had their bodies thrown in the river. No. And just as an aside, never ever do that because the karmic boomerang may be epic. Anyway, this young man was actually, surprisingly, a decent emperor, despite his age, in part thanks to his mother's able guidance her integrity and her insight. But he was not going to be able to put down a military movement by someone who was as seasoned as Ardashir and who was determined to create a greater, stronger Persian empire. So in 224, having observed young Alexander for a couple of years, Ardashir seized the moment and he overthrew the Parthian Arsacid king Ardavan IV, who's shown here on one of his coins. Now granted, coins are not the place to give you really detailed depictions of people, but this is what we have. <clears throat> so Ardashir attacks Ardavan, kills him, removes the power from him, takes over, there's a coup. And this sculpture, which is in 
the necropolis of the Sasanian royal family, known as Nakasherustam, near Persepolis, shows Ardashir on horseback, receiving the ring of power from the god Ahura Mazda, the Zoroastrian god, transmitted to him across a sacred fire. And under the feet of Ahura Mazda's horse, on the right, lies Ahriman, the god of evil. You can see the curls of his head there under the horse's lifted hoof. At the same time, under the feet of Ardashir's horse lies the fallen figure of Ardavan. Great propaganda, the equivalence between the god of evil and the king of the Parthians is clear. <clears throat> Here's a nice picture showing you that relief in C2. And here's a broader view of the very impressive complex of royal tombs. The Sasanians were one of those who didn't go home, they went large. Ardashi went on to become an immensely powerful player on the world stage increasing the size and the prestige of his territory with impunity as Rome continued to devolve through that infamous year of the five emperors and into the reign of the 13-year-old emperor, Gordian III, who would later be killed by Ardashir's successor when he was 19 years old. And it was a shame, people liked him. He apparently was a very nice guy. Ardashir lived with a magnificence appropriate to his status as the king of kings. So here you have the ruins of one of his palaces, also called Adashkade. Here's another view of it. You can see it's on a, on a hill overlooking a nice valley, and it's large. To give you an idea of the kind of scale that he espoused, here's his palace near Katasaphon, which is now in Iraq. It's not exactly as he had it. This is how it looked when it was rebuilt in the late 6th, early 7th century by Khosrow II, from whom the the Muslims would take over. But it kind of gives you an idea of the scale on which king of kings like to live. Now you really can't tell that much from this picture, but you can see at the back in the archway, there's a door into the throne chamber of the king. So you can imagine if this is the entrance, this big archway, what that might, space might have been like. For scale, here's a picture with some cars. This is a massive structure. It was a palace for residence and entertainment. This is not for defense. This is a reconstruction of it. And you can imagine what it would be like walking up that avenue to that enormous gateway, knowing that when you stepped through that door at the end, you would be in the presence of the most powerful man in the world. In front of it, in this area that you can see looks like cobblestones, was a beautiful pool where the king would entertain guests, important personages. You can imagine in the hot night, the Baghdad summer, just as things are beginning to cool down, nice drinks being served on little chairs near this pool, while you contemplate the splendor and the glory of the man who is entertaining you. Well, naturally, as soon as he took power, Ardashir quickly and systematically exterminated 
the members of the defeated King Ardavan's Arshaguni clan, especially the Bartev branches of that clan. Gregory is a Bartev. In other words, he belonged to the family of the overthrown king. He was one of the clan that had been all but exterminated. Khosrov II of Armenia also belonged to that clan. So who were these Bartevs, the Parthians? The empire that Ardashir Sasanian usurped was founded by a nomadic warlord named Arshak I in the third century before Christ. And it was ruled by the Arshaguni Arsasid dynasty that was named after him. At its height, the Parthian Empire covered a huge swath of territory, reaching from the Persian Gulf to the Caspian, to the northern borders almost of India, and nearly to the Mediterranean as well. Its capital, Susa, is mentioned in the Book of Esther, also known as Ctesiphon. These are the ruins of it, the reconstruction, where Ardashir would later build his own palace as a way of making his victory over the Arshaguni, his elimination of the Parthians, his comparatively stronger position than their illustrious empire, graphically clear. So what were the Parthians like and how did they live? As members of the Parthian ruling class, Krikor's clan members had enjoyed a very luxurious lifestyle under the Arshagunis. Their home may have been like this one, a walled compound with a garden, some outbuildings, a beautiful stately home in the middle of it, Parthians appreciated spacious and airy architecture. A prosperous Parthian would have grown up in surrounding something like these. In a building graced with exquisite carvings from nature. and with scenes from the ultimate noble pastime, the hunt. Banqueting Parthians ate from plates like this, showing the enjoyment of the pleasures of life provided for us by the good gods. Or perhaps like this one, showing the famous Parthian innovation in warfare, the Parthian shot, which has come into English as the parting shot, where the warrior would stand up, turn around, and fire behind him. Parthians drank a lot. From vessels like this, this one, you can see the size. Yeah, you think about the yard house. <laughs> it's not a new invention. Like this one for everyday use, this one is just made out of clay. Or on more ceremonial occasions, perhaps one like this. This is bigger than the other one. One of the, one of the purposes of having a banquet in the Arshaguni world was um, to discuss business of all kinds. And so the person who had the best head for alcohol was the person who would not divulge his secrets in such a situation and who would be capable of taking in the information he heard from others and making use of it. Or maybe something like this, beautiful piece. And here's a close-up of the exquisite work 
that is on the stem of that preton, that drinking glass, drinking cup. In other respects, the Parthians were also big on the good things of life. Their everyday objects were often elegant. But they could also be whimsical. <laughs> like this little ram. You can see it's wool. <laughs> or this. My personal favorite. Or this. They loved nature. They loved luxury. They loved craft. They expended loving care and great skill also on their personal ornaments. For example, this collar, this hair comb, which may have been for a man or a woman. This brooch. This belt buckle. Earrings, again, for a man or a woman. Second set of them. The variety is, is pretty much endless and the workmanship is beautiful. And the same care that was taken for personal adornment and for the surroundings in the, in the home, at the banquet, was also shown in personal appearance. In the hairstyles for women, and you know, when I see one of these things, I think, oh, did Gregory's mother look like that? Or this. Again, the carefully coiffed curls and the exquisite headpiece. And it wasn't only for women, it was also for men. The creation of very carefully laid curls, carefully crafted mustache. Here, this king, completely orderly hairstyle, both the hair of the head and the hair of the beard. Even a simple military man paid attention to his appearance. <coughs> In other words, as a member of the Parthian clan of the Ashagunis, the sub-clan of the Suren Bartevs and the sub-sub-clan of the Pahlavunis. Gregory was the scion of an advanced world-dominating culture. He was closely enough related to the Parthian Arshaguni kings of Armenia that it, when, when it came later to developing his career, he could count on his blood ties to them to automatically advance him up the ladder. And it was on those Parthian clan loyalties that Ardashir counted as he began to hatch a plan to eliminate Armenia's Parthian Arsacid dynasty in the person of King Khosrow II. In Ardashir's mind, Khosrow could not be allowed to live. As an Arsacid, Khosrow was left with the moral obligation to avenge his slaughtered family members. It was an unpleasant obligation on many levels. It meant that Khosrov would have to tangle militarily with a superior hostile power that knew everything about him and his military means. It meant that he had to put other aspects of policy and development for his own kingdom on hold in order to accomplish this vengeance, but Khosrov would do whatever it took. It was incumbent upon him to avenge those who had died. So for his part, Ardashir Sasanian, who had not only 
killed Khosrow's nearest relatives, but had executed corporate punishment on his entire social class, extended family, and former allies, knew that Khosrow would do his very best to exact revenge. And in fact, Khosrow did. He attacked Ardashir's territory with considerable success. And so Ardashir needed him to be eliminated. And not just because he was annoying, but also because eliminating him would allow Ardashir to put a more pro-Sasanian king in his place and secure at least the Armenian territory's cooperation in his own future ventures, and he had big plans, if not to facilitate an outright takeover of Armenian territory for Persia. Besides, Khosrov had that extra little problem that he was a client king of Rome. Now, at the moment in the situation, in the disarray that Rome found itself in, it didn't really matter, but one never knew when that might change. And to have an ally of Rome on his western border was not something that Ardashi felt fit with his future plans at all. In order for him to proceed unhindered, a Sasanian client king in Armenia would be preferable. So to eliminate Khosrov, Ardashir needed to recruit a member of one segment of the Bartev clan, the Pahlavunis. This person whom he recruited is known to us only as Anak, which is not a name. And this man agreed to assassinate Khosrov in return for leniency towards the remaining members of his own clan. In other words, this is quite diabolical. Ardashir said, you will go to a certain death. And you have no assurance that I will actually honor my promise to you and show leniency to the few remaining members of your clan. But you don't know that for sure, and so you will go. And Anak effectively sacrificed himself in the hopes of saving a Pahlavuni remnant. And Ardashir's plan for Anak was diabolical in its simplicity. Young Anak, whatever his real name was, and his wife were going to flee to Armenia seeking asylum from their cousin Khosrov. And then they would kill him when the moment was right. So as he and his young wife crossed into Armenian territory, the story goes, the couple stopped for the night at the tomb complex of St. Thaddeus. And their son was conceived there, we are told, on the tomb of Thaddeus, although you can see the tomb of Thaddeus, it does not look <laughs> commodious in any way. It's not literal. An Armenian historian saw this as a harbinger, of course, of his future importance as Armenia's second illuminator. He's conceived at the tomb of the first illuminator. How perfect. In fact, it was a little too perfect for some people's taste. And they said, well, that must be a myth concocted by the historians to give a prophetic quality to the story of Gregory's birth. But one does have to wonder. The young Bartevs, who will never again be able to tell the truth in their short remaining lives, were given hospitality where? <laughs> At what we have seen was one of the earliest Christian sees in Armenia, well established with a 150 year history by the time they came there. They were given refuge at or near a quintessentially Christian site. 
you have to wonder, was that a coincidence? Or did they already know something about Christianity? If it's true that the great Bishop James of Nisibis was St. Gregory's cousin, which we may talk about at some point later, then perhaps Christianity had gained some kind of foothold in that family. And we may never know for sure. But as we spend time next week following the very strange career of that child conceived in Ardas, maybe this question will linger someplace in the back of our minds.